get together. Um, just a really quick introduction as you're eating. So my name is Samuel. So my name is Samuel. I'm with Peer Health Exchange. Peer Health Exchange is a nonprofit. Basically, really quickly, what we do is we recruit college students around New York City to train them to go back into high schools to teach health education to ninth graders. Our health education is comprised of sexual health, mental health. We teach students how to access resources in their community, how to communicate within relationships, listen and speak effectively. And we also teach them about certain stigmas and a lot more. So that's enough about myself. Let's go on. Um, so this is my first time talking about masculinity or presenting a topic like this. So it was definitely eye-opening for me to reflect upon my own masculinity and understand what it looks like to me and to understand what kind of, what kind of actions, I've, what kind of traits I've been portraying within the years that I've been growing up. So as a child, I grew up in a household with two older brothers, one older sister, um, me being the youngest. And I can say that what I learned is that certain things are so normalized that we don't see it until we actually start talking about it inside of classrooms or in a public space. But growing up, I didn't realize what I was doing were traits of toxic masculinity. We're, today we're going to talk about what toxic, toxic masculinity is, and we're also going to talk about how to redefine it and a few other things. Okay? So, Masculinity is a socially constructed concept that people selectively use to describe what a man should be and how he should act. Okay? Just to really quickly touch upon this, a social construct is an idea that has been created and accepted by people in a society. All, right? All men are influenced by their upbringing, experience, and social environment, which play a big role in determining one's view of masculinity and manhood. This means that masculinity is going to be different for everyone, which is why I ask you to reflect upon it yourselves. So can I get a few answers what you thought of or what you shared with somebody else or what you think masculinity is? I know you're eating, but oh, perfect. Um, I said traditionally masculinity um, is about being, was about being the breadwinner and the, um, you know, the person like in historic times, like the one who killed the animal to bring home for the food and then mm -hmm. be, uh, making the money to The backbone of the family, right? Yeah. Okay, great. You asked what toxic masculinity is? No, what masculinity means to you. To me? Well, uh, I guess what it means to society, I mean, traditionally, would be like, boys don't cry, they put on the brave face, stuff like that, maybe. Okay, good, great answer. Anybody else want to share? As I said before, two older brothers. Um, my older brothers were gang affiliated. Um, they grew up, drop, they dropped out of high school. They were in and out of the juvie system. And I was around a lot of things that um, basically created a, a sense of toxic masculinity in my own mind. So I used to think that, you know, being a boy, you weren't supposed to cry. You weren't supposed to act on feelings other than if you were upset or if you wanted something, then you act out. But if you're not going to talk about what you're feeling, if you're going to talk about what you're feeling, then it shouldn't be around anybody else other than your family, and that's it. Um, when I was around my friends, I didn't open up with what I was going through. When I was around um, my parents, sometimes I didn't even tell them what I was going through. And I believe that this was because of the fact that, again, growing up with my brothers, I thought that it was is just not the right thing to open yourself up to individuals if you're a boy, okay? Um, let's move on. So before we go on to explain what toxic masculinity is, I think it's pretty important to understand masculinity and male privilege, okay? So influential factors in shaping one idea of manhood are race, class, ability, sexual orientation, and gender. These social identities determine who has power and privilege and who faces societal oppression. All right, so masculine privilege is the idea that men are afforded unearned benefits, rights, and advantages in society. 
Okay, but it's different from men, for, for men in society. So, for instance, men of color. Men of color in a room full of white men might not have the same privileges or might not have the same um, abilities that white men would have. Or men that are disabled might not have the same privileges in a room full of men that are able-bodied. Or trans men in a room full of cisgender men might not have the same privileges as well, right? But it's important to understand that all men still have this certain sense of privilege, and they have it, and they, women don't have it, OK? So for men with marginalized masculinities, masculine privilege operates differently because they are privileged as men but hold at least one oppressed identity, which is what I just expressed earlier. OK, so where does the idea of being masculine come from? <laughs> Can somebody give me a, an idea of where it comes from? Media. Media, um, upbringing. Yeah. upbringing, anything else? History, history, religion, religion, peers. Peers. your peers. Yeah. Okay, great. All great answers. Again, it's a social construct. There is no right answer. So, masculinity varies um, from <coughs> male to male. So, there is no right answer on what masculinity actually means. So. Boys and men learn appropriate gender roles in accordance to the masculine expectation of their given society. This means that from a very early on, this means that from very early on, boys get messages on what it means to be a boy. So like I said earlier, growing up in my household, I had two older brothers. I was always told you're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to act out on certain feelings. You're always supposed to keep a certain sense of kind of pride on you so that other individuals don't try you, so that they understand you're not the person to be really getting into altercation with. You're not the person to actually try. You're not the person to really just like be friendly with. So I was always the person that was to. I'm sorry, to but what, what about um, you know, males who grew up in like a single parent home, mm. you know, without a father or without a mother, or without both parents? So how do you explain the masculinity? Well, I can't explain masculinity for them. Um, definitely, if they grew up in a household with a, you know, a single mother, um, it's depending on how the mother raised them or what kind of environment they were in. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no exact answer for a household that has one parent, two parents. It's about the environment that they're placed in. Okay? Um, and again, so when boys are brought up, they're placed with blue colors around them, they're placed with cartoons, they're placed with action figures, they're placed with things that are supposed to reinforce the idea that you're supposed to be a boy and you do things that are strictly um, dealing, with, um, dealing with aggression or dealing with just not really showcasing your emotions or just dealing with the idea of not, able to, not being able to um, really depend on others, right? So from an early age, these messages work to shape individuals into boys or girls. Along with outside influences, boys and men learn conventional gender roles from family and friends. In most homes, boys are told that boys don't cry and to man up, right? Like we said before, boys don't cry. You're supposed to man up. You're not supposed to showcase your feelings. You're supposed to be able to hold your composure in any situation, right? OK, so these phrases are ways of relaying the message that as a member of a certain gender, there are tight expectations. If these expectations aren't fulfilled, then one will be subject to ridicule and sometimes violence. So growing up, I'm sure a lot of people have already seen this or experienced it. If you were supposed to confine to a certain norm and you didn't actually confine to that norm, you'd actually be ridiculed or you'd actually be um, subjected to violence. So growing up in elementary school, junior high school, if I wasn't to um, act the way I told you to, act the way I told you that I was supposed to act, where it was um, supposed to not showcase my emotions or not cry or not act out on my feelings. A lot of my friends would, you know, throw out terms. And these terms weren't very friendly. These terms weren't supposed to um, help build my confidence. These terms were meant to cut me down and to actually make me feel less than a man of what I really was or less than a boy of what I really was. So what are some terms that you feel like you've heard before? I don't, I know that this is a space we're full of, we're all grown individuals. Um, so I'm going to ask you to be respectful of everybody, but, and understanding. But what are some terms that you feel like you've heard before when you experience um, an individual 
um, calling out another individual outside of being a male. Fact. Fact. I used to hear that a lot growing up. Right? Another one, gay. Bitch. Bitch. Sissy. 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 Wuss. Wuss, right? And all these terms kind of lead back to the idea of feminizing the individual, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not supposed, if you're not exhibiting male behaviors, then you're feminine, right? So for instance, I remember a time where I was in junior high school and um, I had a really bad crush on this girl, um, but she didn't like me back, right? So I remember one day I had went into the bathroom and I was just like really sulking. I was just like, I couldn't believe it. She didn't want to go to prom with me. What am I going to do with myself? I was crying in the stall and two of my friends overheard it. Got back to the classroom and everybody was just calling names out. And I felt like this was just like, what is this supposed to mean? Am I less of a man? Am I not supposed to cry? What does this mean for me? So understanding that males are supposed to be grouped into certain categories. Um, here we have a man box. So when looking at this man box, you probably can't see it. But basically, there are certain traits that men are supposed to showcase. So how to be a man? Be heterosexual. Be a protector. Display aggression and dominance. Don't cry openly, express emotions. Don't show weakness or fear. Demonstrate power and control. And view women as property or objects. If you weren't to act inside of what's in, in this box, then you might be subjected to some of the terms that we said earlier, right? And I can tell you now, it's not a fun thing to be subjected to these terms. And the idea of being a man, again, being heterosexual and being a protector, displaying aggression and dominance, all these things lead back to the idea of that you aren't able to rely on others around you and you're not able to open up to others around you. So how many of you seen Black Panther? Majority of you? How many of you not seen Black Panther? Okay, so I'm going to try my best to um, <laughs> relay the messages in this slide. Um, to help you understand. So Black Panther was a movie that came out recently. Um, it's a Marvel movie, but it depicted a man named T'Challa and a man named Killmonger. Both of these individuals, I believe, hold, um, T'Challa holds a great understanding of what healthy masculinity is, and Killmonger actually holds what toxic masculinity means. So what I'm gonna do now is display traits of toxic masculinity and link it back to Killmonger. Okay, so Killmonger was a child that was supposed to be a part of a great civilization that was actually casted out. Because of his father, he had um, betrayed the civilization and the king decided to cast him out. While he was being cast out, his father decided to rebel and try to act out against him. When this happened, the father decided to kill him while Killmonger was still a child. So now that the father's dead, Killmonger is a child, he's an orphan, he doesn't have a mother, he doesn't have a father, and he's grown up in a world where he now feels like he doesn't understand his place. So Killmonger displayed a lot of characteristics that were associated to toxic masculinity. He was prepared to be violent at any moment possible. Because he suppressed a lot of his feelings of what happened to his father, he was at the understanding that if he wasn't able to express his emotions through crying or through just speaking about it, he became violent. He joined the army, he joined um, special forces, and he had the idea that he wanted to reclaim what was his. Being a part of a great civilization, Wakanda, um, for those of you who don't, don't know what Wakanda is, basically it's a civilization of Africa um, that had amazing um, tech that were advanced in all aspects, technology, health, um, everything. So he felt like because he was cast out, he wanted to get revenge. He was completely self-sufficient, meaning that because he had nobody growing up, he felt like he didn't need to rely on anybody. Um, in the movie, when the movie begins, he's seen with a female, and that's supposed to be his partner. Throughout, when the movie goes on, he is made, he's supposed to make a decision on whether or not he wants to defend his partner, and he doesn't. He basically shoots her and he says, well, I don't need you because I have a mission and my mission is to go back to Wakanda and reclaim what's mine. If anybody else gets in my way, then you're supposed to be cut down. Being self-sufficient 
um, linking this back, if you haven't seen the movie, the idea that you aren't supposed to rely on others because you're supposed to be the, again, the breadwinner. You're supposed to be the backbone. You're supposed to be strong and not supposed to showcase any types of weakness, right? He also showcases the need to dominate. So when he gets back to the civilization called Wakanda, um, he overthrows the king T'Challa, and he now takes control of the kingdom. So when he realizes what their structure is like, whenever a king is supposed to be replaced, they are supposed to take a herb called the heart-shaped herb. This heart-shaped herb is supposed to transform them into the Black Panther, which makes them gain um, special abilities. Once he realizes that there's supposed to be other individuals that come after him, he decides to burn down the whole, um, he decides to burn down the whole farm or he decides to burn down each of the heart-shaped herbs so that no other individual gets to take that place. Out of touch with feelings and emotional intelligence. So, can't see it there, but when he was a child, um, there's a scene in the movie that depicts him basically with his father and the father speaks to him and gives him the understanding that we should have went back to Wakanda when I was a child. I shouldn't have put you in this position. I shouldn't have portrayed the, the civilization and you shouldn't have been put in the place that you were. Killmonger responds and he says, well, I don't need anybody. Well, I don't need to, um, I don't need to feel like we should um, rely on any of these individuals because we are great in our own sense, right? So he then says, instead of, instead of crying, instead of pulling things out in his feelings, he then decides to react in anger. When he sees his father, he says, I don't want to feel like I have to depend on them. We don't need them. And he decides we're going to go back and we're going to do things the way I should. Or he's going to go back and do the way, th the, the way he thinks he should. Okay. The last part is will not trust, respect, or listen to women. Throughout the movie, um, in Wakanda, there's women put in places of power that aren't seen in other civilizations, in other nations. So throughout the movie, there's, there's women that are placed in power of the queen. There's women that are placed beside the king to advise him. There's women that are placed beside the king to protect him. And throughout this movie, Killmonger actually disrespects them. He doesn't trust them. He doesn't listen to them. He decides to go on his own ideas. He decides to believe what he believes in the beginning, and he doesn't feel like he should respect them at all. So there's a part in the movie where he basically um, is at a point where he's fighting each of these um, warriors that are protecting the king. And while he's fighting them, he just shows no remorse for them. He doesn't seem like he respects them at all for the, 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 um, for the position that they hold in the kingdom. He doesn't respect them for anything that they have. All right? So as we go on, there's another characteristic of toxic masculinity that wasn't depicted in the movie, but I feel like we should still touch upon, is homophobia. Okay, so gender identity and sexual sexuality are tightly bound up in our culture, and being a man means being a straight man. This means that through toxic masculinity, most gay men are feminized, whether or not they exhibit feminine behavior. Okay? Because homophobia is so deeply connected to toxic masculinity, it's learned early on that even in the appearance of homosexuality, is to be avoided at all costs. Boys are encouraged not to hug and certainly not kiss, right? So any kind of um, characteristics that are shown that depict you being feminine, they're supposed to be cast away, right? That's not what being a man is about. That's not what being masculine is about. So re redefining masculinity. So the idea that toxic masculinity shows what a man shouldn't do or what a man is um, brought up to do, I believe that it's important for us to redefine what the term masculinity means. Um, in the movie, again, T'Challa is the king. T'Challa is the main character, and he depicts what basically masculinity should be about. So one of the traits that he shows is that he trusts, respects, and listens to women that are around him. So his mother, the queen, he goes to her for her counsel. The women that are around him protecting him, um, they stay close to him. He basically puts his life in their hands. Um, even his ex is a warrior that he even loves and he still goes to for counsel. 
he constantly shows throughout the movie that the women in his life are just important as the men in his life. Accountability. In the movie, T'Challa gets the opportunity to go back, not to go back, he basically gets the opportunity to meet his father again. After his father passes away, um, T'Challa is now supposed to take the mantle as king, and when he does take the mantle as king, he basically has to take a heart-shaped herb, and when he does this, he gets to go to the ancestral plane. When he gets to go to the ancestral plane, he gets to meet his father who has already passed away, and he gets to speak to him about things that he feels like he should know. When he gets to the ancestral plane, ancestral plane, he decides to ask his father, why is it that you left the orphan alone and you cast him out, and not instead of, instead of bringing him back to civilization? Okay, I wanna show you a quick clip with this. In this scene, it basically shows T'Challa meeting with his uh, father and basically holding him accountable for the actions that he did while he was in his um, position. So in this scene, you can see T'Challa take accountability, one, for understanding that it, was only, it wasn't only his father's wrongdoing, but he said, we must right our wrongs, right? So he understood that it wasn't his own father's doing, it was their own understanding as a nation that they didn't share their resources, they didn't want outsiders inside to understand what they had and what they were capable of. So holding your father accountable isn't an easy task, right? So I don't know about y'all, but I wouldn't speak to my father like that. Because if I were to, then there'd be trouble in the household. But the child here, he's pretty, he understands the aspect of holding people accountable for their actions, right? So when he meets his father, he understands you did something wrong, you have to be held accountable, and this wrong has to be made right. And when he has that, while he has that understanding, he also says that he has to go back and make the corrections. Okay, so T'Challa also shares power. So if you haven't seen the movie, T'Challa has a younger sister, and basically the younger sister is a genius. She basically covers everything that has to do with technology and anything health related. She oversees all of the technolo technological advances, right? So T'Challa basically goes to her for her counsel. He goes to her to, um, to understand what he needs to do or things that he needs to um, basically foresee. So T'Challa thinks that 
it's important to um, hold a sister in the position and not sh not hold the power to himself. So if we were talking about toxic masculinity, somebody who held toxic masculinity wouldn't be as okay to share power with a younger sister who's not of the same age, who may be looked at or regarded as being somebody that um, should maybe be in the position that they're in. Um, so T'Challa is what he's doing is basically um, showcasing healthy masculinity. At the end of the movie, um, after T'Challa and Killmonger basically battle out, Killmonger says that he was always told by his father be, that the sunsets of Wakanda are the most beautiful and the most amazing. Even though Killmonger, an individual that tried to destroy Wakanda, that tried to deplete their resources, he understood that what he did was wrong. T'Challa, on the other hand, understanding that what Killmonger did was wrong, still tried to give Killmonger the opportunity to save himself and to see what he wanted to see at the end, which is the sunset. Um, he asked T'Challa, he asked Killmonger, we can repair you, we can restore you, we can um, basically care for you, and we can bring you back and we can accept you as one. But Killmonger, on the hand, decides again, he doesn't want to um, rely on others, he doesn't want to feel like he has to depend on others, so he says no. But in a sense, T'Challa is showcasing empathy, which is another important characteristic of healthy masculinity. Okay? T'Challa is also in touch with his feelings and emotional intelligence. So, again, even with the clip that you just saw, T'Challa had the understanding that he was wrong, and he had to basically right his wrongs, right? He understood that going to his father, he couldn't hold a sense of um, just suppressing his emotions. He couldn't, because of who his father was, he couldn't, make, he couldn't speak at a, he couldn't basically um, speak to him and not hold him accountable for his own actions, right? So T'Challa understood that to face him, he had to be in touch with his own feelings, have empathy for Killmonger, and also realize what it meant to be in his own place. So to understand others, be in touch with your own feelings, and to have emotional intelligence is another aspect of healthy masculinity. Okay, so also redefining masculinity. Certain things that you can do yourself to basically change what toxic masculinity is and basically understand how to go about um, keeping others accountable is, one, looking for role models. So in our society today, we have a lot of individuals that depict healthy masculinity. A few of them are, list are shown here. I don't know if you all know who Frank Ocean is. Mm -hmm. Frank Ocean is a huge artist, and he himself is very open about his sexual orientation. Okay, even though he may feel like he's a part of a community that may not accept him, he's still open with who he is because he understands that he can't hide that. And he's in touch with his own emotional intelligence and his feelings. Stephen Curry, I'm sure almost everybody here knows who Stephen Curry is, right? No, so Stephen Curry is an NBA player. Um, he's one of the best NBA players there is out there. But unlike most NBA players, he showcases his family. He showcases his lifestyle, he is okay with the idea of um, with showcasing his love for his own religion. He is not um, shy of depending on others in his family. He's always um, referencing, referencing um, what his wife and what his children does for him um, while he goes through the challenges of being in the NBA. Last but not least, does everybody know who Barack Obama is? <laughs> Yes, right? So Barack Obama is known for an individual, known as an individual that um, showcases a lot of empathy. He showcases a lot of um, emotional intelligence, and he also leans heavily on his partner, right? The understanding that he respects, he supports, and he loves his partner, Michelle, is also exhibiting healthy masculinity. All right, so redefining masculinity. We said locate better role models of masculinity. Just because we feel like in pop culture today we have a lot of individuals that may exhibit toxic masculinity doesn't mean that we have to continuously um, hold them to the standards that we do now. We can look for better, better moral models. We can understand that there are individuals out there that do share um, different feelings than, from, than the norm, right? 
We can break down hostile sexism and benevolent sexism and, uh, sexism and understand how they are two sides of the same coin. So does anybody know what hostile sexism is? Would anybody like to share what hostile sexism is? No? It's like an aggressive form of sexism. An aggressive form of sexism. So would you be able to give an example? Yeah, so sexual derogatory words thrown at um, females or women that just basically are meant to um, cut them down, right? Or vice versa. Vice versa. Um, benevolent sexism, does anybody know what this means? That women are weak and men need to help them. Women are weak and men need to help them, but it may not be showcased like that. So certain individuals might say, you might hear it often, well, all women are compassionate, right? So that's why... Um, they're supposed to be the nurturers. They're supposed to take care of the children. They're just automatically nurturers at heart. They're born with that, right? So that is an example of benevolent sexism. The idea that you are grouping women in, just in basically the same category and holding them to, um, and putting them into a box the same way we're put in, men are put into a box um, growing up. Um, so it's important understanding hostile and benevolent sexism and understand why they're equally as harmful in the idea of toxic masculinity. Okay, hold everyone accountable. As we saw T'Challa do, it's important that when you see something, you say something. If they're not your friend, if they're a stranger, even if it's something on um, social media, it's important to hold individuals accountable for their actions. Okay, so I, I knew that growing up, it wasn't easy to snitch on a friend, right? it wasn't easy to call somebody out on something that they were doing. But it's important that we raise our, our children or we talk to the, the, the children that are growing up to hold individuals accountable, hold their friends accountable, hold people that are, are within their lives that they may not still even talk to accountable. Okay? Embrace the emotions that you fear, meaning that for men, it's not the easiest to um, showcase emotions beside aggression, Besides aggression or besides ang aggression, anger, or um, just pride. But as we had somebody share earlier, um, men are supposed to be the breadwinners. Men are supposed to be the backbone of the household. You're not supposed to break because if you do, everybody else breaks around you, right? That's not true. We're supposed to embrace the idea of um, showcasing our emotions. We're supposed to be able to embrace the idea of leaning on the women in our lives. We're supposed to be able to embrace the idea of um, the idea of showing others what we actually feel in the moment, because it's important to let others know so that they can be an assistance to you, right? Practice using empathy. Um, empathy is mostly associated with uh, being a feminine trait, understanding others, um, really just understanding the position and putting yourselves in other shoes. It's not really something that is associated with masculinity, but it should be, right? To improve as a society, you have to use empathy and you have to build upon it and you have to understand what others are going through. Okay, so quick um, <laughs> little activity we're gonna do, I could respond by. So I'm gonna read off a prompt and you're gonna, I'm gonna have somebody basically respond by saying what you would do in the situation. So. Your male friend hasn't been speaking or hanging out with you or your other friends lately. He has been very aggressive when dealing with others and is very quick to react. How would you respond to this? Are you okay? What's okay. wrong? Are you okay? Are you okay? What's wrong? Giving them the opportunity to open up about their feelings, right? What were you going to say? Uh, more or less the same thing. What's wrong? Are you you've been acting this way? Yeah. Giving them the chance to open up to their feelings and giving them the chance to um, do something different from the norm that they've been placed in. You, you want to share? Yeah, one variation would be to say, I've been noticing a change. I've been wondering if something's wrong. If you ever want to talk to us, let me know. Yeah, again. It's the space to, for them to react. Again, opening the space for them to speak doesn't mean that you're um, engaging the situation head on. Mm -hmm. just means that you're giving them the opportunity to take a step through the door. What if that's his personality? <laughs> that's, if that's their personality, that's perfectly fine as well. But it, it still doesn't, it shouldn't stop you from opening the door. Right? Second prompt. A couple on the street is arguing and the male begins to shout begins shouting at his partner and shoving him. 
what would your reaction be? So this is one of those cases where you feel like you shouldn't step into something that's not of your business, right? Mm -hmm. But again, holding individuals accountable. I've been in situations where I've been in the street and I've witnessed part, um, couples arguing and seeing them confront each other in a not so great manner, right? So my reaction to this would be, if nobody has any answers, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, I've seen that too, mm -hmm. and what I'm concerned about is my own physical safety. Mm -hmm. What's this guy going to do to me now mm -hmm. if I get involved? Yeah, so, very good point. I don't want to abuse his partner, but I don't mm -hmm. want to get hurt either. You don't want to get hurt either. So, there's other things that you can do. Call my Yeah. Okay? You don't have to feel like, because it's not your business, you shouldn't try to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Holding somebody accountable doesn't actually mean you have to confront them. It could also mean that you just call support. You know, still address the situation. Okay. You are at a party and you witness a guy continuously touching a girl after she tells him to stop. What would your response be? Tell him to stop. Tell, simple, right? Tell him to stop. What if he's aggressive and he tells you that he doesn't want to stop? Get someone else to get someone help, help you. <laughs> get someone else to help you, right? So still. Get someone? <laughs> if you don't want to... Um talk to him directly, you could go up and ask the woman to come with you, say, yeah, can I get your help for something to get her out of the situation? Great answer. And it's, yeah, an important, it's very important to, if the person is hostile, if they're aggressive, you shouldn't um, confront them. But if they have um, some type of, um, if they're aware at some point, then you should be able to address them and hold them accountable for their actions. Let them know, hey, I saw what you were doing, I don't feel like it was right, you know? Simple conversations, they may not know what they were doing was right. They may feel like, hey, well, this is the norm for me. This is something that I grew up doing. Why should I feel like I have to change? You know, if you understand what's right, you should be able to hold somebody accountable for it. The last one. A guy friend of you posts a picture online of a girl and tries to humiliate her. What would your response be? Drop him as a friend. Drop him as a friend. The healthy masculine way. The healthy masculine way. What would the healthy masculine way be? You can, oh, wait, does somebody already say report them to the social networking site? <laughs> <laughs> so we can report them to the social networking site. Usually, um, you'd be like, oh, dude, that's not cool, take that down. And then the toss of maximum, or like, dude, you're acting like a bitch, like, why are you doing something like that? Yeah, so the healthy maximum way so would be to address them and say, hey, that's not cool, what are you doing? You know, just to stop them at the Stop them at what they're doing and let them know, hey, you got to change it up. You can't continuously um, degrade women because you feel like it's just what's right. I also think it's more effective if a guy friend does this than a female friend because mm -hmm. a female friend would be easy to dismiss or with me. But if a guy does it, he's modeling another way of being masculine that mm -hmm. maybe might take for this other guy. That's a great point. If I were to hear from somebody that's not my friend, or maybe a female, um, telling me what to do when I was growing up, I may not have reacted the same way as if I would, would have reacted to my friend coming up to me and telling me, hey, what's going on? Because if I have somebody close in my life telling me, you need to change what's going on, I might start to reflect on my actions. Great answer. I'm wondering what you would encourage when um, that situation occurs and a guy steps up and says, hey, that's not cool, you know, we shouldn't do that to girls or women, and then there's silence. And like, no one is chiming in with that lone, brave individual mm -hmm. trying to confront the toxic masculinity. Like, how can, how can men open it up to say, why are we doing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To try to unpack it. I think. To come at another angle. I think the way, just my opinion, the way certain girls are raised, women tend to be more conversational. I have to be more descriptive as men are just like very one syllable, like they don't really tend to talk about their feelings more. Like what you're saying, that's not usually something men do, is like sit down and have like. A conversation about it. It's just more pressure off. Yeah, so it's the norm to kind of hold in what you're feeling and just not really to um, say what exactly is going on. So I learned when I got into a relationship 
that I was a one word kind of guy. Um, when my partner would ask me questions, I'd be like, yeah, sure. You know, like, yeah, why not? Let's go ahead with it. And my partner would just be like, okay, do you have anything else you want to say? And I started to learn, you know, my own toxic masculinity in the smallest of ways can be depicted in just not opening up with your partner, not opening up to smallest of questions, not really tapping into what you're thinking, right? So for a um, scenario where you're in a group setting and you're trying to um, address something that you saw, um, you shouldn't have to feel like you have to gather the support of individuals around you. Mm -hmm. The point of trying to redefine toxic masculinity is to go against the norm, right? So if you feel like you may not be able to garner the support that you need, you should still hold strong in the, um, the opportunity that you have to hold somebody accountable. Um, another idea is to take somebody to the side. So understanding that if somebody's showing a bit of aggression or somebody's showing that they're just not respecting somebody in the moment, um, maybe outing them in a group setting might not be the best idea. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be best, especially if you're the friend, to take them to the side and speak to them about what's going on. And you may not have to address what happened um, specifically, but you can say, hey, what's going on? Is everything all right at home? Is everything going on? Is, is everything okay? You know, if you feel like you need to address it specifically, then go ahead and address it. What are your thoughts on like toxic masculinity when it comes to like families? Like, let's say your brother has a sister and he tends to be very um, misogynistic and he treats women poorly, but he's like very protective of his sister. Like, he wouldn't want his sister to date someone that's like him. Like the contradictory, like between them. So. Having a conversation. I don't mean like, it, it sounds like the hardest things because where could a conversation go if they don't really want to open up? But it's really about chiseling away of, at what they're going through or what they're showcasing. So if you see your brother or you see some, yeah, you see your brother um, showcasing these kind of traits, you should actually just call it out for what it is. Be, hold them accountable for it. Um, you should let them know, hey, I see what you're doing. Why is that? You know, can we change that a bit? Let's see how she feels. You know, like, understand um, that there may be absence of empathy in what they're showcasing and try to let them know, hey, you know, we should try to put ourselves in her shoes and try to understand what it may feel like when you do these kind of things. Yeah. Like, we tend to separate, oh, that's my sister and that's another girl, but like, they're still female at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And another thing we do um, which relates to benevolent sexism is calling everybody by, well, our mothers and daughters or our sisters and mothers. We shouldn't treat women in a way where it's, how can I say this? We shouldn't treat women in a way where we're only classifying them as being our family members, so that's why we respect them. Because they are women, because they are individuals, is the reason why we should respect them, right? So you should let them know, hey, even if it's your sister, or your mother, or your daughter, it doesn't matter who it is. If it's another individual that you know holds space on this earth, you should respect them with the same kind of um, intensity that you would your own friend, right? Um, you're talking about benevolent sex. Is another aspect of that. I think is what used to be called chivalry, right? You know, oh, woman is coming, let me open the door. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to what he over his that said about weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that um, women need to be protected and taken care of. And, oh, she can't possibly open the door on her own. I think you open the door for whomever is coming, whether it's mm -hmm. a male or female, uh, transgender, whomever it is, you open that door. But I, I've come across that in my life where, you know, men uh, oh, uh, rush to, oh, shoot me onto the box. It's like, oh, you go first. Why, why is that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's nice to be respectful of anyone. You know, not, not um, make sure, go out of, my, uh, go out of uh, your way, guy, to make sure I go on the bus first because, you know, I'm, I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, um, the, the, the more caustic and, and toxic and um, assaultive kind of sexism is perhaps worse, or definitely worse, but there's that, it's the other side of the coin. And I, I talk to guys about this, and I don't think they, they can see it that way. And it goes back to what you were talking about, I protect my sister. 
you know, because she, she can't possibly protect herself. So it, it, there are all kinds of permutations yeah, to I, this. I can say I was raised um, with the idea that you should open the door for a lady that's walking by, no matter what. You should let the lady go ahead of you if you're on the line. If you should, um, basically, you should treat women with um, the idea that they weren't able to do things for themselves. That's how I feel like I was raised. You know, when I started to, when I first realized this is, I was getting onto the bus one day and it was pretty packed, and um, it was raining as well. So I thought, you know, I saw a other woman behind me. And I said, "Please go on first. And she stopped. She looked at me and she said, "Excuse me, you can go ahead yourself." And I said, <laughs> and I said to myself, "Wait a minute. <laughs> what did I do that was wrong?" I also did. Yeah. Female. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it, there's also another side to it that there's no problem with just being nice, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. But it's again the idea of um, really tackling the thought that they can't do it for them. Women can't well, so do things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Help plenty of other people on buses. Of course. <laughs> you want to say something? I think elderly aside, because if someone is elderly or. Um, you know, challenge physically in some way. I think doing the you know, offering, mm -hmm. not not automatically doing it, but offering or asking, is a way to just be a good human. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking about um, the importance of reciprocity, and when someone uh, opens a door for me, and often places where we're entering, there are two doors to go in. You know, mm -hmm. so I'll say thank you, and then I will reach for the next door and open it and say, your turn. And it's a way of being mutually kind. And then it kind of uh, hopefully uh, dismantles some of the, the gender aspects of it. Mm -hmm. To your point, great point yourself. But to your point, I, whenever I'm on a train or if I'm um, feeling at the moment that I want to give or I want to do something for a woman that I feel like you know, I may be overstepping a boundary, I ask. You know, there's, I don't feel like, no, no, but I, you know, growing up, I would have been the kind of individual to say, no, please sit. You got to sit, you know, with the idea that if they don't sit, they can't live, you know, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's, it's always a great idea to, it's always a great, um, practice to ask before you, um, just assume. You know, so if I'm sitting down on a train and the train is packed and I see an elderly woman, I'd say, excuse me, or I'd tap them and I'd get their attention. Do you want to sit? You know, and if they say no, most of the time I actually get, no, I don't want to. You know, so it's um, not assuming an accent. Okay. What about like toxic masculinity when it comes to women? You like, I've also internalized it. Like for women who want their male counterpart and partner to be more traditional or like the qualities that um, consist of toxic masculinity they have deemed normal like and they, they pass it down when they're raising their son it's like oh I'm raising my um, two year old to be a man it's like and you like at least be a boy first before <laughs> he becomes a man like so he doesn't you know you know those women who want their like um, stay at home dads mm -hmm. or like women who are not I guess that progressive in a sense who so I have those mindsets, mm. you know? I say, so in PHE, Peer Health Exchange, the organization that I'm a part of, um, we teach ninth graders how to communicate. So how to speak effectively and listen effectively. And I believe these practices should be um, used throughout your life, not only when you're in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, even when you're 40, 50, you should still be able to communicate with your partner, your parents, um, any individual that you come across with the intent to listen effectively and speak effectively. So if you had a partner that was um, insisting on raising um, their son and the idea of, you know, they have to be playing with these kind of toys or they have to wear this kind of color. It's a simple conversation, maybe not simple, but it's a conversation that you should bring up, you know, breaking down what it is that they believe to be the norm and show them that, hey, this is the norm maybe because of this and let's try and redefine this. Yep. Does anybody else have anything to put? Because we have to wrap up. Nope. Okay, so I wanted to do an activity where we were gonna do scenarios, but we don't have enough time. But I do wanna thank you for 
um, staying for the whole session and listening. Yeah.